<laughs> okay, thank you for your patience. Um, yeah, so today I'd like to talk about the weather, climate, and some remote sensing data. So I'm Barry Wen, I'm from University of Florida, and here I want to thank my uh, collaborator, Zhong Liu from NASA, Goddard. Okay, first of all, yeah, who is Barry? <laughs> So I got my PhD uh, of meteorology from University of Florida, uh, sorry, University of Oklahoma. And then I did my postdoc at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. As you can see the picture of me here. Uh, let me try this one. Yeah, so at JPL, sometimes your colleagues are not human beings. Okay, and uh, we have a bunch of female scientists there. So if you have good eyes, you may catch me. Can you find me here? <laughs> yeah, this one, this one, this one, <laughs> okay. Yeah, so after I did my postdoc, I went to Oklahoma again and working as a research scientist at NOAA, uh, NSSL, National Severe Storms Laboratory, working on the radar stuff, and this is a photo taken by my son, yeah, when I was operating the uh, QUN weather radar. And uh, here is my son, uh-oh, yeah, and this is our cat, yeah, <laughs> they have very good relationship, yeah, unless sometimes the cat give us a lot of scratches, <laughs> okay, yeah. So today, um, I'd like to talk about remote sensing because as you can see from my past, I, I've been working uh, on the satellite and also ground weather, uh, ground weather radar stuff, and I think it's pretty cool for everyone to access the data and to use it, so here I want to share, yeah. So first of all, what is remote sensing, yeah? So for sensing, it's using instruments or devices to measure parameters. Yeah, what are the parameters? It's very like abstract term. Parameters actually are like temperature, like how cold, how warm it is today, uh, or the uh, precipitation or rainfall rate, like how much rain you can get, right? Yeah, so for example, the thermometers can measure temperature, and also the radar guns can measure the speed of passing cars, right? They are all sensings. And generally, there are two categories of sensing devices. One is the in-situ sensing, and the other is remote sensing. Yeah, for the in-situ sensing, it's the in-situ sensing or measuring devices are in contact with the medium or the object they are sensing. Okay, and uh, for remote sensing, it's by <laughs> the, right, literally, it's the sensors are not in direct contact with the objects they are sense. Yeah, so here we have examples, stream gauges. Are stream gauges um, in situ sensing or remote sensing? In situ. Yes, in situ. Good job. What about the rain gauges? In situ. Good. What about the weather radars? Yeah, remote sensing. Yeah, remote sensor. Yeah. So this is actually uh, a Rexpo radar, a mobile radar I brought from Oklahoma last year to Florida. We had some cool field campaign. And then the Hurricane Ian came, so we use this radar, did a lot of like <laughs> data collection. Okay, then what about satellite? Yeah, remote sensing for sure. Okay, so far away from the sky, right? Yeah, so I actually put them together, you can see, yeah, for precipitation, for example, yeah, for rainfall rate, we actually have so many sensors to measure the rainfall rate. Yeah, you can have the in situ measurements, right, from the rain gauges, or you can have the remote sensing from the radar and in the sky, in, no, not in the sky, actually, in the space, we have the satellites, right, we have all different kinds of satellites. Yeah, so for all these kind of sensors, they have their own advantages and disadvantages. Yeah, so we can go from one by one. First of all is the in situ measurements, the ground precipitation gauges, yeah. So for the gauges, yeah, we actually think they are the most accurate measurement of precipitation. Yeah, so we still need them, we still need them. Yeah, but however, the, they have limitations. For example, you can measure only one point, right, one location of the precipitation. Yeah, you, if you want to have a map, you cannot have it. And also, it needs a lot of maintenance and quality control. So sometimes you will find a dead bird inside the, <laughs> inside the bucket. Yeah, so it needs a lot of maintenance and quality control. Yeah, because of this, yeah, the, you cannot have too many of them, right? And here is a video to show. Yeah, so if you have 
all the ranges all over the world and put them together. Actually, you can see it can only take the surface area of two basketball courts, which is not good enough, right? <laughs> so first thing, we need like big picture. Ideally, we can have the global map of precipitation. And the other thing we can do is, as our citizen, we could put more ringages in your backyard. There are actually a lot of programs, like Coco Russ. If we are interested, please yeah, contact me. I can help you to set up the, your ringage in your backyard yeah, to monitor rain. And it also benefit us, help our scientists to, to provide you with the better precipitation products. OK, yeah. So next is ground weather radar. <laughs> yeah, so actually we have so many ground weather radars all over uh, United States. Yeah, and we call it next red, next generation of radar network. Yeah, so uh, you can see this is a map. This is a map to show all the radar locations. And uh, um, yeah, so, so of course from, so for this kind of, uh, Radar network, it, ha it was built since like 1980s. Yeah, so in 2013, they upgraded with like the polymetric uh, 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 characteristics. So what is the polymetric characteristics? So previously, when you have the radar signal, it's only like one direction goes out. But after 2013, instead of like only one single direction, they have like two directions. Yeah, what's the benefit if you have two directions? Yeah, you can actually get the shape, right? If you, if you send something, you have like the horizontal dimension and also you have the vertical dimension, you can sense like if the rain drop is like flat or it's round, right? And also it can give you like some information about what is the hydrometeors, if it's a rain, if it's a hail, or sometimes if it's even not the weather echoes, it's some maybe birds or some like insects, okay? Yeah, so it will greatly improve the rainfall estimation. And uh, in our, uh, in my old lab, the NSSL, we actually have the most advanced uh, weather radar. So as you can see, the traditional one is a big dish, right? I bet every one of you, you may say something very similar out there. But the most advanced one is a phase array radar. Yeah, it, it, so traditional one, they use the dish to rotate and then to sense right, the, the, the weather around the radar. But now we have this kind of phase array. They use, they actually rotate the antenna electronically, so which will make it very fast to sense. Okay, so pretty cool for the ground weather radar. Yeah, however, for ground weather radar, it also have limitations. Okay, so here is like a, a map to show the coverage of the ground weather radar network in United States. And you can see, okay, so in Florida, it's actually pretty good, right? However, in western mountainous area, yeah, there are a lot of gaps. Yeah, because why? We have like the mountains and it will have like, like some uh, beam blockage for the radar. Right, so you cannot see what's going on here in, at the surface level. And another issue is for the uh, ground weather radar data, it's very complicated to use. Yeah, because for the radar scan, it's like it has the tilt and uh, elevation angle, and then do like scan for like uh, for like 360, and then tilt again to uh, do another 360 degrees. Yeah, so when you get the data, it's like this shape. Yeah, I bet no one wants to use it, include myself. Okay, yeah, so this is the uh, limitations for the ground weather radar. Okay, so here I put like everything together. As you can see, for each sensors, they have their own advantages and the disadvantages. What we want to do is, of course, we want to put everything together, right, to take their, uh, to put the advantages or strength of each sensor together and then try to uh, mitigate these weaknesses. Okay, so these are the uh, sensors different sensors for precipitation measurement, okay, yeah. Then I want to use some examples to show the radar data, okay, yeah, so, mm, okay. For the um, extreme weather events, uh, I want to start from the tornado one, okay, yeah. So when I mention tornado, I have to talk about a very unlucky town, uh, Moore, the city of Moore in Oklahoma is actually about uh, three miles north of my uh, American hometown, Norman, Oklahoma. Yeah, so um, may, you may already have heard about it. We have like 
two major EF5 tornadoes hit this town. One is in 1999 and the other is uh, 2013. And uh, yeah, it was pretty sad. A lot of people killed and, uh, and a lot of houses got destroyed. Yeah, so a tornado is like a uh, very dramatic event and we can actually use radar to observe it. Yeah, before we went to radar the remote sensing, I want to share a video. Yeah, it's actually to <laughs> capture by the camera. Okay, so this is the event from Texas. Okay, and here it's nice to show the structure of the supercell. It's like the mother cloud for the tornado. Okay, so first of all, you, you may see some like, these are actually smoke. And if you look at it, the smoke actually goes up, right? Yeah, the smoke is sort of like the tracer. Yeah, you can see it's like the smoke goes up to join the updraft. So we see here is like an updraft, yeah, in the left of the video. And uh, also here in the like uh, right, it's quite dark. Why? Because it's raining here. Yeah, and now you can see it's like more and more rain going down here, and here is the updraft goes up, and here is like downdraft, the precipitation goes down. And also if you can see it's like rotating, right? This is the wall cloud, it's rotating here. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool. Yeah, and you can see the precipitation is actually around, around the wall cloud, and more, more precipitation here. Yeah, the downdrafting here, okay. So, and the more structure. So now it, this guy zoomed out and uh, you can see the whole structure, yeah. Okay, yeah, so this is what we just uh, stared at. Uh -huh. And when it zoom out, you can see some shear, shear cloud, and this is brought by the gust front. Okay. Okay, and uh, yeah, you can see this is actually lightning. There are definitely a lot of lightning out there. And still the whole mesoscale, yeah, mesocyclone rotating. And uh, let's wait, it will have some final clouds. Yeah, you can see some clouds generating here. See some, yeah, some clouds generating and the whole whole world cloud going like rotating the anti-clockwise, yeah, because it's like the low pressure center, okay. And something developing, developing here. Mm. Okay. Yeah, every time I watch this video, I got amazed by Mother Nature, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, and you can see some like the dust got kicked up. Mm. Yeah, I think this guy, <laughs> the photographer got a little bit of panicking just now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can see more clouds forming mm -hmm. up there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so more here. Okay, so of course we want to observe this kind of dramatic tornado weather events. However, we talk, about, we talk about it, the structure uh, of the radar data is complicated, right? Yeah, so scientists, uh, try to bring all the radar together, then mosaic them, then put them to the nice three-dimensional Cartesian system. Yeah, so now you can use the radar data easily. Okay, and when you put them together, you can actually, if you look at the horizontal map of the uh, structure we just saw in the video, it actually can come up like this one. And uh, if you look closer, if you this, this one, see this structure like a hook, yeah, we say it's a hook echo, and a lot of times we use a hook echo as the indicator of the tornado from the radar images. Okay, yeah, so next you will think about, yes, this radar data is so cool, right, to show this kind of tornado structures. Can we, can we access it? Can we see it? Actually, we can. Yeah, so if you click on this one, you cannot click, but you can just open Google if you have a cell phone right now, and uh, input like MRMS viewer. Yeah, you can go to this website. And uh, this is actually sponsored by University of Oklahoma and also the NOAA NSSL. And it can give you a lot of um, radar data there. Yeah, so uh, I don't know if I can, yeah, maybe I, 
I don't know what to uh, waste time here, but you can try by yourself. I highly encourage you to try it now, okay? So you go to that web page, you can see all the data, all the time step there. Yeah, so this one is uh, for one event, April this year. Yeah, so uh, the EF2 tornado hit Oklahoma again, and uh, you can see clearly this hook echoes right for the uh, tornado outbreak. And uh, from this one, you can actually generate the animation by yourself. You can see clearly how this um, um, supercell is developing, and uh, you can capture this kind of hook echoes out there yeah, by yourself. Yeah, again, all these data are available online, and uh, you can generate these cool animations. Yeah. OK, so this is the, uh, for the reflectivity yeah, tornado structures. Yeah, so next I want to talk about another example for extreme weather is a hurricane. Yeah, so for people like us living in Florida, it's not, right? Yeah, it's very familiar for us. Yeah, again, you can go to that website and choose the time, yeah. So for this event, I choose like Hurricane Italia. Yeah, it's happened like uh, in, uh, in August, late August, right? About like one month ago. Yeah, so you can choose the time as like uh, 2023, uh, August 30, and you choose the time about like 8.30 UTC, yeah. So, and you will get some cool picture or cool animations here, and remember to choose like the loop image, then you can see the developing or the evolution of Hurricane Italia. Yeah, so all of this data, all of these images, all of these loops actually on your fingerprints, <laughs> fingertips, okay. Yeah, so this is the yeah, very cool <laughs> feature. And also I want you to notice that um, the city um, <laughs> Monticello is here, right? We can actually see more stuff here. Yeah, okay, yeah. So this is the loop we just saw. You can see the precipitation, right, goes all the way. Yeah, the hurricane carry a lot of precipitation passing our city, <laughs> Monticello, and then yeah, we can dump all this precipitation data to the hydrological model, and then you can see the um, the flooding, yeah, developing. Okay, so this is actually this uh, indicating the unit, uh, let me see, the unit flow. Yeah, and you can see it's like if the color goes like uh, purple and blue, it means the uh, river has really high, really high volume of water there. Yeah, let's show it again. So I actually did not have enough time to uh, to do the Google search, but for people you live here, did you experience any flash flooding uh, during Hurricane Italia? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, a lot, okay. Yeah, so if you experience, welcome to talk to us. Okay, so we also want to write down all these kind of observations in our data set to train our hydrological model and also to train our remote sensing product. Okay, and also during yesterday's uh, reception, I heard some people complain about the weather like these days. So I also made, made a loop using this website like five minutes to make this loop yeah, to show the precipitation events going on these two days. Yeah, so this is, we know we had a lot of rain these two days, right? And this is what's going on. <laughs> yeah, it's like the, the very large, uh, very large weather system, yeah, bring a lot of rain, yeah, to a panhandle area of Florida. Okay, and again, I welcome you to check out this awesome website, and this is near real-time uh, website, so every time you have some, like, events uh, going on, you can go to that website to, to check out all these kind of uh, weather radar maps by yourself. Okay, okay so next is the, uh, I want to talk about some NASA missions. Okay, yeah, so the first, uh, okay, so first of all, NASA centers, because I mean, there are a lot of chances people come to me said, where is NASA? Actually, NASA have a lot of centers, okay? Yeah, as you can see, it's like about like more than 10 centers all over United States. And I am only familiar with two centers. One is NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory because I did my postdoc there. And the other is NASA Goddard because I'm affiliated with them, yeah, currently. Yeah, so there are like different missions for different centers. And uh, uh, I, I believe all of them is like open to public. As long as you can register, you can have a nice tour there. 
Okay. Yeah, for NASA, they have, again, a lot of missions, and I am affiliated with the Earth System Observatory mission. Okay, so for the Earth observation, we actually have different kind of topics. We have the clouds, convection, and precipitation, which I am attached to. And of course, we also have aerosols, we have the mass change, like the larger scale mass redistribution. We also have like the surface bio biology and geology and the surface uh, deformation and the change. Yeah, so we have all kinds of satellites launched to observe and study all these topics. Okay, for the time-wise, yeah, we also launched a lot, a lot of satellites, yeah. So um, you probably are familiar with like Landsat or Terra, Aqua, yeah, these are like launched before 2000. Okay, and uh, so we also have like an aqua launch in 2002, yeah, and then all the way for the train uh, 1997 and for the GPM, yeah. So you can see we have a lot, a lot of satellites launching there. Yeah, so I want to focus on two satellites because these two satellites I'm affiliated with. One is the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission, GPM, and the other is aqua, okay. For this uh, Global Precipitation Measurement Mission, GPM, it got launched in 2014. Actually, before the GPM, we have another satellite called TRIM, T-R-M-M, Tropical Rainfall Measurement Mission. It was launched back in 1997. Yeah, because of the big success of TRIM, uh, it only focused on the tropical region. Then they launched the second satellite, Global Precipitation Measurement Mission, yeah, in 2014, to extend from the tropical sites uh, range to the whole global range. Okay. The cool point for the GPM is because it has the uh, a radar on board. Yeah, it has a pretty cool radar on board. The why we want to have a radar on board a satellite because the radar can actually give you a 3D dimension, the vertical structure of a precipitation. Yeah, so this makes the GPM standing out from other satellites. For other satellites, normally they can only look like the two-dimensional map, but for the GPM, it can actually give you 3D information for precipitation. Okay, yeah, so for all this kind of precipitation data, you can actually also access them and to check out by yourself, and it's pretty cool to shoot like the global precipitation map. Yeah, again, you can, you can access and generate this map by yourself. And from this map, you can see we have like the raining bands here, right? ITCZ zone. Yeah, you can also have some like a desert area without too much precipitation. Okay, yeah. Okay, so next is the AIRS mission. Yeah, so AIRS is actually uh, its own board aqua is actually one satellite in the family of A train. Yeah, so when I started, I also got confused. What is A train? Seems quite like complicated, but actually it's pretty simple. A just means afternoon, afternoon train. So there are like, I don't remember, it's like 14 or 18 satellites. They line up one by one, and one by one, yeah, it's like a train, and they are passing the equator. Uh, around like 1.30 p.m. in the afternoon time, yeah, ascending from, from, from uh, south to north, so we call it a train, okay? And there are like all kinds of satellite sensors together in this train. Yeah, we have like CloudSat, MODIS, AIRS, and OCO2, yeah, all these kind of cool sensors. And for AIRS, this is our group, the atmospheric uh, infrared sensor or uh, something, yeah. So this is some like pictures to show this kind of cool satellite, cool sensor. And uh, uh, what's the same point for AIRS? Yeah, so most of the satellite sounders, they only have like uh, more than 10 channels. Yeah, so for each channel, each band, it can give you information from the different heights of the atmosphere. However, for AIRS, it has more than 2,000 channels. <laughs> <laughs> so you, when you put like more than two sound channels together, you can actually get a very fine resolution, right? Temper uh, the vertically, yeah. So you can get the uh, temperature or humidity at each level, 
Yeah, so this is also pretty cool feature to check out. And uh, the Airs was launched back in 2002, so you can get like more than uh, almost, yeah, so 20 years data for Airs to check the climate change, right, if you are interested in. Okay, yeah, so now I actually talk about a lot of weather radar and a lot of satellite missions, and I'm sure you probably feel like that's overwhelming. Yeah, actually, but when you look at some like nice tools, you will find all this data are very easy to access. Yeah, so next I want to talk about the GeoBunny system. Yeah, it's NASA, a NASA system. Yeah, so a lot of people also, including research scientists, they came to me and said, hey, for this NASA data, can I access to this data? And uh, are they free? Yeah, so the answer is, yes, you can, everyone can have access to this NASA Earth observation data sets, and they are all free. Yeah, so it's quite simple. You just go to uh, the website, the GeoBunny website, and then you can find all this data there, like NetCDF files or HDF5 files. I'm sure yeah, some of you, when you heard like NetCDF or HDF5, this file formats, you may be shaking because it, a lot of us don't know how to, how, to, how to deal with this complicated data format, right? Actually, yeah, you don't have to. So one way you can do, you can be a programmer, you process all this data by yourself, or you can go to this website, Giovanni website, and, uh, and then you can just uh, to pick up the data, it's like a data buffet. <laughs> you can pick up, to pick up whatever you, you, you are interested in and to plot, ask the system, NASA system, the tool to plot for you. So here I just want to give a very quick uh, view, quick tour, yeah. When you go to Giovanni system, you can see it's like you have the data source, the, the temporal resolution means you want the data daily, it's like every day you want to see the precipitation or temperature, or you want monthly, you, you only care about uh, if it's hot or cold in the last month, okay? Or you, can, you care about like spatial resolution, how big, how details you want to see it, and you want to see the beginning date or ending date. And there are all like, like a lot of descriptions there, okay? so. I will leave the slides here so you can follow this one by yourself. Yeah. So I just want to show some examples here. Yeah. For example, if you uh, go there, if you choose a time average map and you choose a precipitation, yeah. So you can actually generate the map by yourself. Yeah. This one is from actually from the model data. The model in digest the airs we just talked about and the gauges, the in situ measurements and the satellite data. Yeah, so you can see this kind of like the presentation here, right? And also you can modify this data to make it look prettier in your eyes. And of course, if you are a programmer, you can also download all the data to process by yourself. Okay, yeah, you can, it has the download option. You can also download the figure by yourself. It is pretty cool. And another thing is, I mean, so you can have like the time average uh, map, right? And also you may think about, yeah, the, 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 the map you just say seems different than you thinking, right? Yeah, because it's the whole year. You can also bring them down to different seasons for spring, summer, or winter, right? Or fall, right? So if you choose like a summer, you can actually see the different map, right? And this is seems about right in my eyes because during summer you have a lot of sea breeze events and you will have like the, a lot of precipitation happening like the coastal area, right? Yeah, and also because I'm talking here, so I also put like <laughs> the city, um, yeah, Monticello's, the latitude, the longitude there, and uh, we can only focus on this area so we can check some climate change for that one. Okay, so for this one, let's only focus on this small spot for, for our location right here. Yeah, so then I type like temperature and I found a nice uh, data set. It's from the model data and it's monthly, right? And it can go back to 1979 all the way to the to, to end of September this year. Okay, so let's see what's happening. Yeah, so we, if we put everything together and say like a year round temperature back to from 1979 to like last month, What's happening there? Can you see any trend? No, not in my eyes, right? <laughs> yeah, I tried hard, but I cannot see any climate change trend. However, like we talked about, you can break them down to different seasons, right? So you can have like the summer season, spring and fall, and you can have winter season. So have you, can you observe any trend now? 
Yes, the winter, right? Definitely there. We can, you can also zoom in, right? Yeah, for this one, you can definitely see some nice trends. Yeah, for winter, the model and the observation telling us it has a warming trend, yeah, in our location, the city of Monster Travel. Okay, yeah, so, so uh, this is the end of my presentation. Uh, so if you have any questions or if you have any requests for any kind of remote sensing data, please let me know. Okay, and another thing is I want to do some like advertisement for our department. <laughs> so Department of Geography and we welcome all the uh, undergraduate students and the graduate students and we have pretty cool program there. We have like all kinds of um, the, yeah, it's geography, uh, meteorology program and, uh, and also medical, <laughs> medical geography programs there. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Thank you.